Okay, our group to do a homework problem today is the last one before we start over with new homework groups again. So that's Andrew, Trace, and Sarah. <laughs> did you do it? Yeah, I did this one. I don't know how my stuff would be now. Yeah. Start talking, don't worry. Don't worry. So uh, the question is, what force in Newtons must be supplied by the elevator's cable to produce an acceleration of 0.82 meters per second squared upwards against the 180 Newton frictional force, and the elevator is, has a weight of 1,550 kilograms? Uh, do you have the same numbers? No, you have different numbers than it's up there, so. Oh, yeah, I do. Both ways at the same time. I swear my handwriting is better than this on paper. That's fine. Oops. It seems to be wait a second. What? Did... Oh, this uh, is... I screwed up on this part right here. Is that... Yeah, that was yeah. better. Yeah, I see the eraser. I think you need to back there. No, I I timed something so bad on it. So this number is actually different. That number should be this. Should it be this? Should be six.
That's what I got too. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's some jewels, though. I got two point. Yeah. Why'd you do that? This is too much. That's a thousand. Oh, Sorry, wow. my handwriting is really bad. Okay. Because it's a yeah. jewel sword. run quickly over a few of the key aspects of what they did here. First, starting at the top, note that we have Newton's second law. You have the elevator, you have the forces acting on the elevator, force of gravity, force of friction, and the force of the cable. And so they you take the free body diagram, which that works for me, for my purposes here. And I have force C was up, force F and force G were down. So that's how they get this equation. And by definition, Newton's second law, that's equal to mass times acceleration. And the acceleration was upward. And so that's why this is a positive acceleration. And then they just did their work, found the force. Now this here... If we want to be correct, we have to put the vector signs above those. It's the force vector dotted with the distance vector. And so the distance was vertical. The force is also vertical. So it turns out that force vector times distance vector is just force times distance. But you, you have to have those vector signs. And so this was asking specifically about the force from the cable and the force of the cable was vertical. The distance it moved was given as a vertical, so that was correct. Now this one here, they did not show how they got that equation. There's more than one way to get that equation. What's the first way you learn to get that equation? Which I assume is the way you guys did it, by the way. That's the second way. The first way was just with the kinematic equation with V final squared minus v, V initial squared minus V initial squared is equal to two acceleration times change in position. And the V initial squared was zero. And so they got that equation just square rooting. That's how, I, is that how you guys did it? The other way, what DJ said would be the network is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Well, what's the net work? Well, the net work is going to be the net force times the distance. So you would take net force. Well, we know MA is the net force since net force is MA. And so I take the mass times acceleration times the change in height. And that's equal to the difference in, so one half M the final square, difference in kinetic energy. And I have that equation. Notice that there's an M in every term, so I can cancel the M's. And if I multiply everything by 2, 
I'll get rid of the one halves and I have the same equation as the kinematic equation. Now, in some cases, the kinematic equation may be harder. In this case, it was clearly easier. <laughs> but I want to show there's two ways to skin that cat. And then the final one was the work done by friction. Once again, you need the vector signs. And in this one, they had one itsy bitsy problem. What's that? Um, no, they, they did do that right. The work is force dot distance. What direction was the force of friction? Down. What direction was the distance? Up. So with those vector signs, you have the minus sign here and you have a negative answer. Now that's not the final answer because it didn't ask what's the work done by <laughs> friction. If it asked what's the work done by friction, it should have been a negative value. And what they had was the calculation for the work done by friction. So how do I go from the negative value for the work done by friction to the correct positive answer? How much went into thermal energy? So this is the amount of energy that was taken away by friction. You can't create or destroy energy, so all of that energy is what went into thermal energy. So negative the work is what went into thermal energy. And that's how the sign comes back to being positive. But if they'd asked what's the work done by friction, that would have been a negative answer. But paying attention to signs is kind of important. Here, it turned out that the sign they use gives you the correct answer, but not for the right reason. Okay, any questions about that whole problem? Okay, let's talk about lab yesterday. First of all, Max's thing, when he did his video processing, it turned his sideways. They did that for some others too? So if it turns it sideways, simply use the x direction for your data. You'll have positive and negative, I suppose, reverse. You could also take the xy coordinate system and rotate 90 degrees, and then the horizontal direction is your positive y. Um, there's supposed to be a way to use video land client to reorient it, but I couldn't get Capstone to reopen the files once I did that. But I will tell you that the files all are vertical, just like they're supposed to be on the Samsung tab tablet. Second thing, you probably saw my email message, or my actually announcement on Moodle, that number one, I had one digit wrong in the site license code. It took me a while to figure out that was the problem. Um, so I sent you the correct one in the email. Um, also, I discovered that the camera on that Samsung tablet is far inferior to the camera on our cell phones. Because you know, our cell phones, we have actually a pretty sharp image for those, but there's a lot of blur. Yeah, the first one I analyzed was Andrews, and I was using the um, the Union College logo on Andrews' shirt, but that Union College logo started stretching really big. It was hard to determine where things were. So I find most of you whose heads aren't completely decapitated in the frame. I said to use the nose, but maybe choose the center of the ears. It's an easier thing to gauge because you, for most of us, you can see the ears. They stick out a little, and so you'll see the border of the ear, and you can just choose the center of it um, as a, a way to mark it. Once you get your data, remember four data points, highest elevation, lowest elevation, um, fastest upward speed, fastest downward speed. For each of those times, you're getting both the elevation and the speed. Then you calculate the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And using the lowest position as your reference for potential energy, you know that the highest elevation, the only energy you had was your potential energy. And so that's your total energy. And then assuming that energy is conserved throughout, you're going to calculate how much elastic energy was in each of the other positions. That's how much energy was being held by the trampoline. Hopefully, it was a good learning experience about energy as well as a fun experience. I know I had a good time except for when I was trying to do alleys with DJ and I landed on the side of the trampoline and now I have a bruised heel. Went on the side of the trampoline while I was hugging the stanchion. Okay, one more thing on energy before we get to the mighty mo. So, this is a pendulum. It is a bowling ball on a string. What kind of energy does the bowling ball have right now? 
Okay, potential. What kind of potential specifically? Gravitational. Gravitational. If I let it go, what's going to happen to that gravitational potential energy? It's going to convert to kinetic. It's going to convert to kinetic. A question for you is why? Why does it want to convert to kinetic energy? An easy answer is nature always tries to go to the lowest potential energy situation possible. Why does it do that? Because potential energy is defined by a force pushing you that way. So if a force is pushing you that way, it's going to try to go that way. So it's going to try to go to its lowest potential energy. But it converts it to kinetic energy. It's moving. When it gets to the bottom of its swing, we'll say it has zero gravitational potential energy, but it has kinetic energy, it's going to keep going. The energy can't just stop, and so it's going to come back up. What's happening with energy as it comes back up? It's turning it back into gravitational potential. So I let go. Right now, potential energy, kinetic, back to potential, kinetic, back to me. Now, a very standard physics demonstration that I'm really worried to do in a classroom like this because I like to do it when I have a board against my back is to bring it up to my chin. See, I already have two, two scars there. If I let go and I don't move, it's going to swing down, come back. How high is it going to come? Okay, DJ says the same place. Why? Because all the energy is conserved. Okay. And so when it comes back to being all potential, it should be the same potential, hence the same height. So we do it. And we hope that I didn't swing forward or backward. <laughs> it's a little safer than it looks because I said energy is conserved. We're not going to gain or lose energy. But as you saw with that problem, there is some amount of friction. There's some amount of friction up there. There's also the air that this bowling ball has to move. So it loses a little energy. So if it starts on my chin, it comes back, it won't come quite up to my chin. Right? It's what? A couple inches lower? Because of the energy that was lost during the swing. Any questions about how this thing works? We saw a reality that, that mechanical energy wasn't conserved. Total energy has to be conserved. Um, I'm going to take that down now just so it's not in the way of the projector for the rest of the day. Okay. Get out of the way later. Okay. Now I am going to do, and I'm going to attempt to do this just on the PowerPoint presentation, which, uh-oh, this could be trouble. I didn't start the presentation before I started recording. Previous experience says that could be trouble. Well, if it is, I'll just stop. Well, I don't want to stop the recording. Well, let's see what's happening. See what happens. This is the problem that I actually wanted you to do at the end of class, but not getting a number because getting a number is hard. So we have a problem here. This is actually numbers based on the 2018 Nissan Altima. The 2018 Nissan Altima, at least I got the numbers rather quickly, from what I read has a mass of 1,492 kilograms, has a, well, this is the drag force equation just because I didn't expect everyone would remember the equation, where the density of air is that value, the cross-sectional area of the car is that value. And the drag coefficient is 0.26. Now, I was mentioning to, to Nathan yesterday, that's much lower than the drag coefficient on earlier models of the Ultima. They lowered the drag coefficient. Why would you want to do that? Okay, it's going to allow you to run faster. That's one thing. It also allows you to run at the same speed with lower power requirement because you have less resistive force, hence you're going to get better fuel economy. So you have lots of reason to want to, want to improve the aerodynamics to get that drag coefficient lower. Okay, there's also a constant rolling friction of 146 newtons. You guys know that your tires are not hard. They will flex. If you go over a curb, they will flex on the curb. That makes the ride smoother. It also allows the bottom of the tire to actually flex a little and grip the road and increases the traction a little. 
but it also costs you energy. If you had tires that were rigid and didn't flex, you would actually get better fuel economy. Wouldn't handle well, but you get better fuel economy. So you're losing a little in fuel efficiency to make it a safer, more comfortable car. So that's what the rolling friction is, is the energy required for the flexing of the tires. And the engine produces 182 horsepower, horsepower. And then the question is, what is the maximum cruise speed of this car? And I put it in miles per hour. Since we're not going to get a number, we're not going to actually, you know, worry about miles per hour either. So how should I approach a problem like this, right? This was supposed to be your closing problem for last class period. It's something you should be able to do. It asks about power. It gives you a force equation, another force. How in the world do you approach this, right? This is the kind of thing that comes in the, the synthesis problems on the test where you've got these ideas you haven't seen put together. You have to figure out how to put them together. So does anyone have any ideas? When you have no ideas, what's a good place to start? Diagram. So I'm going to draw a diagram. Here's the car. And because we don't know what to do, I'm going to go ahead and do what I know, add the forces. So I'm going to have the force produced by friction because that's what drives the car is the force of friction. The engine is pushing the tires and the ground is not letting them slide. So there's a force of friction pushing the car forward. Then I have the force of rolling friction, which I know to be, oh yeah, I should be a little more careful. Static friction, because I just call that FF above 146 Newtons. And I have the force of drag so I've drawn all my forces on there the one number I didn't use is power so when I look at this because it gave me power what is that going to make me think will be my method of solving this Well, what ideas does power bring to your head? Does it bring up ideas of force or energy? Okay. Energy is the bigger idea it brings up. There is force involved with power. After all, I ended last class period by saying that power is force times speed. But we think of it mostly as an energy situation. And so I'm going to, well, and you can solve this either way of thinking. But I'm going to say my energy in per second had better be equal to my energy out per second. So what's adding energy? The power from the engine is what's adding energy. What's taking away energy? That would be the force drag times the speed plus the force of friction times the speed. Right? And how would I have done this otherwise? This force of static friction is the power of the engine divided by the speed, right? Um, so I could have gone either way. So here I have an equation. Well, I know the value for this. I know the value for this. I'm looking for V. I need to substitute my equation for force drag. So that was V squared times V is going to make it V cubed. So I have the power of the engine is equal to those two things that both depend on speed. How do you solve this equation? For, we now know numbers for everything in there except for the V. So the last step is how do you solve this for V? I'm looking for somebody lazy to answer. I know, everybody's like, well, I'm not lazy, so I can't answer. Somebody give me the lazy answer. How's that? That sounds better, right?
What, Emily? You need that zero. Um, you can't because it's not equal to zero. I mean, you, you can factor it, but it's not going to really help you because it's not equal to zero. This is what we call a quartic equation. And there is a stupid formula I learned when I was in high school for solving these. But what I did is I went to Wolfram Alpha, and I put in my numbers for all of the constants, and it told me the speed was 71 meters per second. That's how you solve a hard math problem in today's world. When I was in high school, we had to know how to solve a quartic equation. I have long forgotten because it was hard. But now you just use Wolfram Alpha, okay? Everybody got that? On the test, you won't have to solve something that has you know, quartic. 71 meters per second, calculating that two miles per hour was somewhere in the ballpark at 150 miles an hour. The question you get. Uh, do we have like a, a number for the static friction force? Or is that no, we cool? don't. But that comes from the power of the engine. So the static friction force times the forward velocity is the power of the engine. So I can oh, okay. go back and forth. So I could have determined it if I'd done forces by just taking the static friction was the power divided by the speed. Okay, I thought F, F was just everything, like force here and friction there and friction there. Dude, okay. because the tire is not spinning, I can directly make, you know, if the tire was spinning, then <laughs> get a little harder. Yeah. Okay, so the point of this, right, your physics stops when you get to this equation. Then your physics stops and it becomes a math problem. And I'm not nearly as concerned about math as I am about physics. All right, move forward. Today we're talking about momentum. Hmm, who has momentum? Cleveland Browns have momentum. Not only should they have won their first two games if they had a place kicker who could you know, put the ball between the uprights, they did win their third game. Man, you know that's their first victory in almost two years, right? Now they're coming into Oakland to play the Mighty Raiders, who also have what we might call momentum. They have dominated their last two opponents and lost both games, plus losing the first game to a clearly superior team. That's what we would call a negative momentum. Momentum is a measurement of how hard it's going to be to stop something. It's going to be hard to stop the Raiders' slide. Might be hard to stop Cleveland's, you know, forward progress. I'm not going there. But we use the term a lot when we're talking about sports. We'll talk about this team has momentum because they are on a roll and it's hard to stop them. So what team is actually on a roll, like has won all three games? Like Chiefs. Okay, the Chiefs. The Chiefs have won all three games, and they've won them pretty handily. I think the closest of the three was the one against San Francisco last week, which was really a blowout of San Francisco scoring a few at the end. So the Chiefs are definitely on a roll. They have a lot of momentum. It's going to be hard to stop them, which makes me sad. But what it is what it is. Well, momentum in physics is that it's going to be hard to stop. And we measure momentum with mass times velocity. Now, this is a good time to point out, well, isn't energy also, if something has kinetic energy, isn't that going to tell you how hard it is to stop it? Yes, it does. In fact, historically... Up until, oh, I don't know, 200 years ago or something like that, people thought of momentum and energy as roughly the same thing. Now we think of them as very clearly two different things. Momentum is mass times velocity. Notice velocity is a vector, momentum is a vector. The Raiders have momentum, it's just in a negative direction. So <clears throat> why is momentum important? It's, mo it's important for how we use it. We've talked about conserved properties. I said, Energy is conserved. You cannot create or destroy energy. You can only transform it from one type of energy to another. Momentum is sometimes conserved, and it's very easy, well, very easy, theoretically it's easy, to determine when momentum is going to be conserved. And it comes from Newton's second law. Newton's second law is not only a truly a calculus equation. Newton's second law is not some of the forces is mass times acceleration. That's an approximate form. That's the correct form if mass is constant. Well, for everything we have done up to there, you'll have a homework problem or two that has mass changing, but everything we've done up to now, the mass has been constant. If the mass is constant, then
then the change in momentum, change in mass times velocity, is just mass times change in velocity. And since it's change in momentum over change in time, change in velocity over change in time is the definition of acceleration. So what we've been doing has been approximately true. It's been correct in every case we've used it. But the correct Newton's second law is this equation here, which I can solve for momentum to say the change in momentum is net force multiplied by change in time. Now that gives us two conditions where the change in momentum is zero. What are the two conditions that would make the change in momentum zero? Okay, a little more general than nothing if the net force acting on it is zero, right? You can have things act on, like right now, things are acting on me. Gravity's down, normal is up. If those add up to zero, then momentum will be conserved. The momentum will not change. The change in momentum will be zero. So that's one of them. If the net force is zero, change in momentum is zero. What's the other condition? And this one sounds silly when you say it. Only one other variable in that equation. No time. No time. If no time passes. So like if I have a photograph, the momentum of the object in that photograph will forever be the same in the photograph. That's basically what that's saying, which sounds kind of ridiculous. But we'll have cases where that's approximately true. The classic case of it being approximately true is a collision. When you have a collision, the actual collision is very short time usually. And so you can say during the collision, the time is approximately zero, so momentum is conserved. Not conserved before they collide, not conserved after, but it is during the collision. So for lab next week, we're going to have collisions on a track, and we'll say the momentum is conserved during the collisions even when they stick together because the time of the collision is very short. Um, well, problem is there is friction involved, and it has to have a short. If there was no friction, it would be conserved because the net force is zero. But because there's friction, we're saying during the collision, it's conserved because it's a short time. Afterward, not so much. Now, just for some terminology, terminology that I hate. This here is called the impulse. But for very obvious reasons, this here is called the change in momentum. Since that's how we read delta P. P is momentum. Delta is change in. So change in momentum equals impulse. We have a different word depending on which side of the equal side you're on. One last thing before I move on. What are the units of momentum? Okay. Somebody said Newtons. You can do it in Newtons. It's going to have to be Newtons times seconds because that's what a force times the time is. Or if you just look at M times V, what are the units looking at that way? Uh, like kilogram and meter yeah. So either one of those, they're this exactly the same meaning. They're units for momentum. We don't have a special name for it. For energy, a kilogram meter squared per second squared, we said that was a joule. I forgot to give you the name for the unit of work. The unit of work, which is energy per time, hence joules per second, has the name watt. A horsepower, as you see from here, a horsepower is 745.7 watts. And that is indeed supposed to be calculated for how much work a horse can do. So you take the force a horse can pull with and the speed that it's pulling with, and that gives you one horsepower. Of course, it's standardized. You don't measure it again for every horse. All right, so let's play with some problems. Let us say the momentum is conserved in the collision between the blue car and the yellow car. If you're doing a problem where momentum is conserved, first you need to establish, is momentum really conserved? So how would I establish that? I would have to look and say, 
what are the external forces, and what is the time involved. If it's a collision, in almost every case, we'll say the time of the collision is so short that we can say, yeah, momentum is conserved during the collision. So that's all I'm going to do here is say, short enough time, momentum is conserved. Once I establish that, then I simply say, momentum initial has to equal momentum final. So momentum initial is going to be mass of car one times speed of car one initial plus mass of car two times speed of car two initial. Momentum final, mass of car one, speed of car one final plus mass of car two, speed of car two final. It gets kind of clumsy having those two subscripts. Sometimes you'll see V and V prime. So they'll, instead of saying V2 final, they'll say V2 prime. So you'll see that kind of notation just to be aware. So if momentum is conserved, Well, then in mark that PX. So the sum of the momenta in the X direction initial is the same as final. So I have I have that equation. Now in this problem, I was given the mass of each car, and I was given V1 initial, V2 initial, and V2 final. So the only thing I don't know is V2 initial. So how do I solve this for V2 initial? I just subtract M1, V1 initial from both sides. And then I have M2, V2 initial. Oh, wait, I wanted final, didn't I? All I have to do is change this to final. I put two instead of final. And then I'll have, I know, I need to change those to twos as well. What? Yeah. I need to pay more attention, don't I? Nobody listening? So M1 V1 final is equal to M1 V1 initial plus M2 times V2 initial minus V2 final. Put that in the calculator, divided both sides by M2, or no, M1, divided both by M1. And I get for my final answer, Whoops. Every time I lift my pen, it changes. Well, actually, every time I lift my finger. So I just put that in the old calculator. Of course, 2 minus 4 is minus 2. Minus 2 times 4 fifths minus 2 times 0.8 is minus 1.6. 5 minus 1.6 is 4.4. And so we're able to calculate how fast it was moving after the collision just by using conservation of momentum. 
Now, the one that keeps trying to change to real life situation. <clears throat> I was trying to show my my friend conservation momentum. So we were out there at the ice skating rink at Riverfront Park, and I explained, okay, so we're both stationary, and I'm going to push you, and then you'll see how much you move and how much I move. It'll be really cool. And so you see here an example. This would be you know, me, and this would be Nalco. And the mass of Richard, yeah, 80 kilograms. That was about right then. And the mass of Nalco, 40 kilograms. That was about right. And so I pushed her, and you know, she went maybe a half a meter per second. And if momentum's conserved, what's the momentum initial here? Zero, because we both had zero speed. So the momentum final here, you have to decide which way is forward, which way is backward. I choose right as forward. So it's going to be – but you have one of these speeds is positive and one's negative. And you go through the math. All the numbers are shown here, so there's no math to do other than to verify yes, indeed. 80 times 0.25 plus 40 times minus 0.5, minus because of the direction, is equal to zero. Now, what really happened, just so you should know what you're doing, is not this. After I carefully, carefully explained what was going on, she fell, she cried a lot, and she was really angry at me. Not only was that bad, when I took off my boot, my ice skating boot, it was filled with blood. And when I took off my sock, my foot was fine. Somebody else's blood. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, it was great. Um, I want to actually have the students do a problem here. So skipping right to the end. Let's say the mass of the puck is 100 grams. I'm just making up a number. The mass of the goalie is 100 kilograms in all of his gear. And let's say that the puck comes in with V1 is equal to a good shot could be as fast as, you know, 100 miles an hour. They, they can beat that in, in hockey. So a good shot, let's say it's 100 miles per hour. Convert that to meters per second and determine what the speed is in the end if momentum's conserved and the goalie holds on to the puck. Yeah, so, so they have the same speed. The puck and the goalie have the same speed in the end. But would it be slightly different if you stop this? <clears throat> yeah, if, if it bounces off him, it's going to be different. That's right. So get, get together with your groups. So this would be Michael, Leslie, Emily together, Ryan, Lydia, and Nathan together, Wes and Sarah Ha huh, together, DJ. You might as well. You know, work with another group, Sarah, since, you know, Wes is gone. Um, DJ Madison and James together. Mira, Max, and Clayton together. Andrew, Trace, and Sarah together. Hmm? Um, Nathan is... Hmm, you are with Ryan Lady. Um, okay, so the ones that only have two would be um, Mira and Max.
Oh, wait. It's the put in Yeah. What's the conversion for miles per hour to meters per second? Um, let me look that up. Yeah. Okay, let me look this up and then I will come and check with you. Um, 0.447 meters per second. Yeah. So should we have? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Since our time is up, I'm going to have the two groups that have called me, because both of them are very close, and I think between the two of them, they'll get it straight if they do it together. So why don't both of your groups go up there and show your solution. Oh, I'm so sorry. Now, I'm going to change... I'm going to change to the other place, so you'll have to re have your numbers written down. Okay, and be quick because we're out of time. Okay. Yeah. Do we could both go at the same time or what? Um. Why, why don't you have DJ's group set DJ, up? DJ, go. You you have the numbers right, and they oh, have the setup numbers. right. Where's okay. Your setup? Oh, nice. Um. I think we have the number right too. That's my setup. Right? So we have. Mass one, V one, plus, and then the mass of the goal that was the same mass G plus VG equals mass P final plus VP final. Third time. Oh, sorry, okay. times. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe you didn't have it right. <laughs> mass goalie final. V goalie final equals zero. So problem on the other side, the uh, mass goalie times not plus. Oh, thank you. <coughs> okay. All and right. So all of that is zero. Correct. The right hand side is not equal to zero. You shouldn't have that equal zero. That oh, was a correct good. equation. No. Yeah. Oh yeah, because everything has numbers. So where is this one thing there? There we go. So that's equal to zero because the goalie is not moving because that's zero. Uh, we know the mass of the puck to be 100 grams and the velocity to be 0 0.44 meters per second. Kilograms for the so puck. So other group, correct them. That's where their yeah. mistake is. Kilograms. Yeah, it needs to be kilograms. So it's just point 0.1? So point 0.1 kilograms, and what's the speed? That's 44. Yeah, it's 44.7. So then 44.7. You had one, or 100 miles per hour, and you had one mile per hour. 44.7 meters per second. Okay. All right, and so uh, same, same mass on the side, mass didn't change for the puck. Uh, but now it has a different velocity. Uh, but it's also the goalie who has a different velocity, so his mass becomes relevant, which is just 100. So we can factor out VF, which would be the, the sum of these two times VF. And so then we can just divide this to uh, our sum over here. And so, uh, given that it's that, we can just know that it's 4.47 uh, meters per second kilograms, which as y'all know to be newtons. Uh, we can divide that by the sum of this right here. So that's 100.1 kilograms. And that'll equal VF, which is... Which is equal to zero point zero four four six five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's right. You can see your number was very close, but you forgot to include the mass of the puck in the end. Right. They include the mass of the puck, but they had the numbers wrong. Okay. Sorry, that took a little extra time, but I want to make sure we got a chance for Seuss to get that extra credit. Have a great day. Remember, homework due tonight, lab due tomorrow, reading quiz due on Friday. Yeah. Okay. And DV is TDT, right? Oh. Just like the So he is two square root two, right? Right. right. And so you have 
natural log of t plus 1 times t squared over 2 minus the integral of t squared over 2. Um, you, oh, you, you did it already. Time. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And now, in order to get this one, I have to substitute again. Yeah, yeah. So did I substitute the right thing? Um, just, just say, for this one, just say u is equal to 2t plus 2. Okay. And so if u is 2t plus 2, then t squared is going to be a polynomial. And then when you divide by u, it's going to be easy. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Are you going to be in your office between like one and two? One to two. One to two? Okay. I will class two. Perfect. I just have a question on if I'm doing the lab right. Second thing, did you have a chance to call? I, yeah. I was going to call this morning. I